Okay, so it might be time to get started. Good afternoon. Thanks very much for attending my session. My name is Martin Klein. I'm with the research library at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, and I'll be talking about reference rot in scholarly communication um, today. And I'll offer a uh, solution to the problem. So this is not a uh, this is not a tennis match. This is a team effort. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge acknowledge my uh, colleagues and coworkers. There's of course Herbert van der Zompel, who unfortunately cannot be here today because he's on a sabbatical in Europe. Uh, Sean Jones and Hari R. Shankar from uh, all of the three uh, from uh, Los Alamos as well. And uh, I have uh, collaborators at the University of Edinburgh, the Language Technology Group in particular, Claire Grover and Richard Tobin that I'd like to acknowledge. And uh, last but not least, Andy Jackson, who looked into the decay of uh, uh, web resources at the uh, web archive of the British Library, and uh, he and his uh, uh, graphs in particular uh, inspired a lot of this work. So. What I'll be uh, covering today is basically three main areas. I'd like to motivate um, the topic, give you a brief introduction of what we're talking about here. I'd like to go uh, and spend a little bit of time on our latest uh, um, published research uh, on the quantification, precise quantification of uh, reference rot in scholarly communication. And last but not least, as mentioned before, I'll spend a little bit of time in proposing a solution of how we can address uh, the problem. All right, so let's get started with a few uh, uh, introductory uh, comments. So when we talk about reference rot, there's basically two things that we talk about. The one is uh, link rot, and I'm sure everyone has seen the notion uh, of uh, something like this. The infamous 404 page not found error. You, uh, you visit a web page today, you bookmark that URI, you try to revisit a couple months later, and then you get this, right? This is particularly ironic because that's the uh, canonical website of the General Assembly of the Internet, International Internet Preservation Consortium, uh, but that's beside the point. So link rot is the first aspect of uh, content, uh, of, I'm sorry, of uh, reference rot. The second aspect of uh, reference rot is content drift. Well, so what is that? Uh, the canonical website of the Digital Library Conference uh, in, in the year 2000 was this, dl00.org. That's what the page looked like in the year 2000. This is what the page looks, looked like in 2004. And just by eyeballing it, you can get the idea this has nothing to do with the Digital Library Conference of the year 2000. Uh, this is what the page looked like in 2005, and I don't even know what this is about anymore, but the point is it's not about digital libraries, it's not about the conference, right? Since 2000 and about eight, the page looks like this, and they promised to do some fancy project management for you, believe it or not. So the point is, uh, as we all know, resources on the web are dynamic. Not only do they come and go, but their content changes. Uh, like this one. Uh, a possible theory is that someone did not re-register the domain, right? dl00.org, someone else took over and uh, published now content that has nothing to do with the original intention of that uh, canonical website of the conference anymore. So, briefly summarizing the first few points. The definition of reference rot is the combination of link rot and content drift. That's the first definition. The observation is that those resources are subject to a reference rot, right? They change and they go away. Um, the problem becomes, or one of the problems becomes, when we write uh, scholarly articles, when we write research articles and reference to those resources using their URI. Because that, at the end of the day, with uh, the notion of reference rot in mind, really threatens the integrity of our scholarly record, right? Scholarly articles uh, are, to a large extent, based on the references that we trust that uh, can be uh, um, uh, revisited after a particular point in time and can be uh, uh, consumed by the, by the reader. The problem, though, is that unlike other scholarly articles that we also reference in our articles, the custodianships for these what we call web at large resources like web pages and uh, scholarly wikis and uh, uh, your project website, the custodianship is a completely different one. We're talking about uh, web admins that just happen to have a page online that may not even know that you as the author of a scholarly article referenced them. Another uh, example, and you may be aware of this, is um, um, this page. So when you consider the case where the Supreme Court writes an, uh, a report, an opinion piece, and references a resource on the web, just like uh, um, Justice Alito did in this case, and the, um, the custodian, the web admin of that web resource recognizes that and tries to uh, raise some awareness of his case, he changed the content of his page. 
and says, well, aren't you glad you didn't cite uh, to this web page in the Supreme Court report and so on and so forth? Uh, if you had, like Justice Alito did, the original content would have long since disappeared and someone else might have come along, purchased the domain in order to make a comment about the transits of linked information on the internet. Right? So that is basically the point. You can actually make the case that content drift is the much bigger problem compared to link rot. When you discover a, a rotten resource, you see the 404. Well, of course, it's a bummer, but at least you know it's gone. It's not what you expect to see. Where you, uh, uh, if you see that, you, you don't know, right? Is that what you intend to, to see or not? Or well, sometimes you see it too long. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, so, another um, um, entertaining yet detrimental example of uh, uh, reference rot in uh, um, its scholarly communication. So there's a ton of um, uh, link rot studies available. Uh, one of which is um, uh, this one, our 2014. A uh, paper published in PLOS One where we precisely quantified the notion of link rot and somewhat in a brute force ad hoc manner estimated, approximated the notion of content drift. Uh, so these slides are available online. I'll, I'll share after talk so there's no need to, um, uh, you don't need to, to uh, rush and, and write down the URI of this, of this article. So what we did with our current study and that literally has been published two weeks ago, uh, also in PLOS One, uh, we de designed a method to accurately assess and quantify the notion of content drift um, and come up with the precise numbers of how bad is the problem overall. The data set that we used was basically the same as we used in the 2014 study. Uh, we, get, we obtained uh, 3.5 million articles from three different corpora, from the physics preprint archive, from Elsevier and from PMC, from PubMed Central. All of these arc articles were published somewhere between uh, 1997 and 2012. We had to do some, uh, some conversion and uh, post-processing in order to extract all URIs referenced from those articles, from within th those articles. And those URIs are all to what we call, again, web at large resources. So again, those are not references to other scholarly articles identified, for example, with their DUI. But those are really references to and your project website, your scientific wiki, uh, data sets, videos, all the, uh, all the above, right? Uh, and as, as you can see in the table, in the last row, in the bottom row of this table, we extracted um, a bit more than one million URIs from uh, these three corpora. So a, a significant, actually unprecedented uh, uh, scale of a data set for this kind of a study uh, till date, to date. And of course, it will be, uh, become important in a second as we keep track of the um, publication dates of each and every single article that references a web at large resource. So these three graphs are not meant to be read, so ignore the axis and so on and so forth. It's just my three marketing graphs because the, uh, the, the curves go up, right? The point just is to realize that the, um, the dotted lines, the fine dotted lines, are the number of URI references in all three uh, corpora over time. So these graphs are just there to support my point. Uh, authors increasingly so use URI references to web at large resources. Right? So of course, you know, in, uh, PFC you know, took up at some point, later on, <coughs> archive, uh, within the archive corpus it became uh, increasingly important from let's say 2007, 2008 on. The point is, the trend is there. We cannot and do not want to stop that trend, but it's a, it's a, it's a fact, right? So we need to deal with this uh, sort of a problem. Okay, so how do we go about assessing and precisely quantifying the notion of content drift in our scholarly articles? Imagine a timeline. At some point in time, the paper was published. A paper was published that references a web at large resources, uh, a resource by the means of its URI, right? So a paper that contains a URI. And for each of these URIs, then, we use uh, the Memento framework, and I'll uh, um, so, uh, talk about this in a second, the Memento framework to obtain archived copies of those referenced URIs surrounding the publication date of the article that references <coughs> the URI. Okay? And uh, so if you imagine that the paper was published at time t, we obtain an archived copy of that URI, what we call a <coughs> Memento, uh, from time t minus 1, as close as possible to t, but previous to t, right, prior. And uh, we might uh, obtain a memento, an archive copy of that URI, uh, published, or uh, created rather, 
after the uh, article was published at time t plus one. So now we really have this uh, uh, surrounding uh, time interval basically around the publication time of the article and uh, we create uh, we, we look for memento, what you call memento pairs, a memento pre and a memento post. Previous, created previous to the publication of the uh, article and created post publication of the article. The uh, kind of unique aspect of this is that we are able to use the memento framework uh, and uh, we can look up those, um, uh, we can look for those mementos pre and post in a total of 19 archives around the world. It's no secret that the Internal Archive is the, the biggest and uh, uh, the, the archive that has contributed most of those mementos, no question about it, but there are others. Uh, in total, we obtained 650,000 memento pairs, so pairs for 650,000 of our 1 million euros. So that's good. Uh, we found the mementos. What do we do now? We need to identify representative mementos with the notion of what did the author intend to cite at the time of the publication of the article. Well, in order to do that, we compare the content, the textual content of these two mementos with, with the assumption in place that if the memento pre is the same as the memento post encompassing the publication time of the article, then that is the content that the author intended to cite at the time uh, he or she wrote and or published the paper. Okay? Two examples for this, uh, two screenshots of mementos, pre on the left, post on the right. This uh, URI was cited in, uh, in a scholarly paper with the DRI that I put up on top of the slide. The paper was published in August of 2009, on August 15th to be precise. The memento pre is captured from the Internet Archive on uh, May 8th of that year, the memento post uh, captured on August 27th, and just by eyeballing you can see well, maybe something went wrong with the capture process, but clearly the content has changed. Right? So that's an example of content drift within what, three and a half months. So that's an issue, right? It's not all bad though. Of course we dug out an example uh, that uh, displays the opposite case. Uh, another URI that has been referenced by, by a, uh, a scholarly article, referenced there, an archive actually published. Uh, published on July 4th, uh, 1990, 99, 97, not 77, my apologies. And um, the Memento Pre was uh, created just roughly um, uh, a month prior to publication date. And the Memento Post, I actually didn't put it up there, because this is still the version that you can dereference today. So the argument here being, this URI reference presumably has not drifted, <laughs> the content of that URI reference has not drifted uh, a bit in 19 years. All right, so back to our uh, comparison of the pre and post memento. Two questions arise now. A, how do we compare the textual content of these two? Uh, and B, what do we, how do we assess representatives? So how similar do they have to be so that we can call them, we can label them as representative of what the author originally intended to cite? So, we use four very common uh, text comparison um, um, uh, measures, Simhash, Jacquard, Sarrison, and uh, Cosine. Without going into detail here, the difference between the four is, um, there's basically two, two, three major differences. Simhash is hash-based, so it is sensitive to even the, uh, the, the tiniest of editorial changes, a comma here, a, a fixed typo there, uh, Simhash, um, um, response to this sort of changes and gives you a notion there's a, a minor change. Uh, Jacquard and Zerdson are both uh, based on sets of characters. So if you know um, uh, tuples, for example, of characters change, Jacquard and Zerdson would uh, would trigger that, would give you a notion of something has changed. And cosine, since it's TF-IDF based, it's more the contextual uh, uh, indicator of hey, there's. Um, the context really has changed. There's a difference in the most salient of terms between these two versions. So that gives us a notion of uh, um, you didn't just fix typos in these two versions, but actually the content really has changed because the most salient terms are not there anymore as I've seen before, right? So uh, a, a good spread of uh, similarity measures that in aggregate should give us a good idea of whether those documents are um, the same or not, the two compared documents are the same or not. So that answers the first question, what similarity measures are we using and why are we using those? Now the question arises, uh, since we normalize the score output of all these four measures, when do we know that they're actually the same, the two compared documents, right? 
So our intuition was, well, let's go all out, right? They are the same as long as all four uh, measures agree that they're the same. They give the maximum score of 100. Um, and if that would be the case, if the momentum pre and the momentum post would score 100, perfect score for all four similarity measures, then we would call them as the same and hence as representative of what the author initially attended. But we didn't quite feel comfortable with that, so we, th we thought we'd go for a sanity check there. Uh, meaning, um, HTTP as a protocol is able to um, return particular headers to you when you dereference the resource, and that header can give you an indication, or some of those headers can give you an indication whether a content uh, has changed um, be between, two uh, be between two requests for the same resource. So we use in particular the ETAG and last modified headers, and compare those headers for the Memento Pre and the Memento Post. And if they are the same, then we know that HTTP says these two resources are the same, okay? And uh, as a matter of fact, we pass our own sanity check, which is always a good thing, right? Uh, uh, the vast majority of Memento Pre and Post pairs that are, according to HTTP, the same, indeed score the perfect score throughout our four simulator measures, uh, and hence we're, we're really content with the idea of, uh, of using that very strict rule uh, of perfect scores throughout the board, right? All right, so back to our comparison. We do compare um, Memento Pre and Memento Post. We figure out that they're, if they are the same, if they're really uh, uh, contextually the same, or, and, and the text rather is the same, and uh, uh, we end up to see 313,000 uh, URIs having a representative mem a memento in our web archives available. So given that we started off with 1 million, we are now down to 30%. Oh, that's the name of the game, right? Okay, so this is good because now we know with the level of confidence what the author intended to cite at the time of publication. How do we assess content drift? Well, we compare the what we call representative memento with the life version of that URI. Right? Makes sense because that's the time when we're actually consuming the paper, when you're reading it, when we're, when we're following the reference and dereferencing the uh, the URI that the author uh, put into the paper. Oops, go back. Need to go back. And uh, we notice because then uh, we have the other problem that LinkRot kicks in again, and uh, only 241,000 out of our 313,000 actually have, still have a live version of that uh, URI available. So we can only make that comparison for 240,000 uh, URIs. Okay, so what we do next is then, as I mentioned before, the comparison between the representative memento that we determined earlier to the textual representation of the uh, life version of that URI. We apply our same uh, four similarity measures to assess that similarity, and uh, for, the, uh, for convenience reasons, basically we bin the results into six bins uh, by similarity score. So. Uh, I mentioned that the scores are normalized between 0 and 100. The first bin represents values between 0 and 20, 20 and 40, 40 and 60, and so on and so forth. And the last bin is where the similarity score equals 100. So that's the perfect score, okay? So plotted out, it looks like this, and I realize it's a bit small to, uh, to read, but we'll get there. So we distinguish now uh, for greater insight, basically, uh, between our four similarity measures. We have uh, SimHash on top left, cosine top right, Jacquard and Sørensen on the bottom. And our uh, bins, our six bins are represented on the, on the x-axis of each and every single graph. Uh, the first observation that we can make from this graph is that the pattern is fairly similar, right? So we see very little uh, dissimilarity. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, very little dissimilarity. And uh, um, the notion of um, a, a perfect score, the similarity being the highest between the uh, representative memento and the life version, indicated that the rightmost column in every single graph, the uh, lightest blue, the lightest shade of blue, and uh, the, um, the relative values represented by the line on the right axis, we see, for example, um, Sirius and Jacquard basically score something 30% of uh, 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 um, uh, perfect similarity scores, so those 30% of those URIs have not drifted at all. Um, and uh, cosine is a bit more restrictive. 
just roughly a bit more than 20% of your arrays have not drifted. 30% of uh, uh, SimHash, uh, according to SimHash, resources have not drifted. So that's the, the uh, setup basically per similarity score. That's a bit confusing, right, because it's different scores. So we aggregated all these scores into one graph. Looks like this. Again, the, the pattern is the same, the shape is the same. Um, the rightmost column in this graph represents the amount of your right references that have not drifted over time, over all three corpora and over all your rice. And as you can read roughly, and that's the good news of this uh, graph, 23.7% of your rice have not drifted. It's good news, the bad news of course is then the, the flip side of the coin, right? Three quarters of your rice have drifted. How much have they drifted? Well, that's a very tricky question to answer because they're somewhere between, uh, you know, these, these lower bins. Um, what that translates to in terms of how significant that change is, we don't go there, we don't know. Uh, but the, uh, the, the point is that they have drifted to some extent over time, right? Um, the, the measures that we apply arguably are, uh, or inarguably rather, are, are somewhat crude and they only compare text, right? So we don't know whether an image has changed, for example, those sort of things. Um, but since we're using a good variety of different textual similarity measures, we can confidently say that you know, these three out of four URI references have drifted over time. This graph is where uh, the acknowledgement to Annie Jackson comes in, uh, because now we're um, basically visualizing the same sort of data uh, separated by corpus and also over time. So this is the data for archive, for the physics preprint. And the, uh, the color pattern is the same. The lightest blue on top is the portion of, or the fraction of your eyes that have not drifted, when the similarity is 100%, or it was 100, rather. And everything that's black is link rot. So again, both together make up the notion of reference rot. So we can see, for example, we have a bit more than 20%, let's say 30%, of your rice unchanged, not drifted for the archive uh, physics preprint corpus, and roughly 10% link rot. Right. But if you go back only to, let's say, 2005, it seems like you have roughly 20% link rot and only maybe 10% of content not drifted, which means 90% of your rice are subject to reference rot, either link rot or content drift. So that's an alarming number, right? Uh, and of course, the numbers go, uh, get worse the further back in time you go. Right. Uh, if we talk about articles published in 1999, for example, we're looking at a link rot rate of almost 50% and a content drift rate of, uh, 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 of URIs that have not been subject to content drift of maybe, maybe 5%, maybe 10%. Point is, numbers get worse over time. And um, the pattern is basically the same for all three uh, corpora. Right. The, uh, the reason why the PMC corpus on the top right seems a bit more uh, wild, let's say, is that we didn't get too many articles from PMC prior to 2004, 2005. Hence the numbers are a bit, uh, maybe be, be taken to, with a grain of salt there. But we see also the numbers of Elsevier is actually, actually worse in terms of uh, link rot uh, compared to archive. In our 2014 paper, we tried to analyze why that is by looking at the URIs and figured out that Elsevier um, articles published in Elsevier increasingly or more so reference .com URIs than, uh, for example, archive uh, papers do. Uh, um, uh, more so reference .edu domains, for example, that are known to be more stat, more, more uh, persistent, let's say, um, than uh, .coms, .orgs, you name it. All right. So that was, in a, in a nutshell, the results of our uh, most recent study, uh, quantifying, precisely quantifying what the uh, notion of content drift is in uh, given our three corpora uh, generated um, from uh, archive, um, Elsevier, and PMC. So what can we do about it? We introduced the notion of uh, robust links. Basically, as the name gives away, uh, we're trying to make links, URI references in scholarly articles, more robust. So now you can say, well, isn't that what DOIs are meant to do for us? And we say, not quite. So as you know, DOIs were designed to combat link rot for links that point to other scholarly articles. So the design principle is slightly different. 
In addition, it relies fully on the custodians of these DOI identified resources, and obviously they're uh, uh, motivated, strongly motivated to maintain links to their content because usage of their content is at stake. Right? So there are strong incentives for uh, such custodians like publishers to maintain uh, uh, DOI references. So they will be uh, mapping to the new location in case the, content has, uh, the location of the content has changed and so on and so forth. The custodians, as I alluded to earlier, the custodians of our web at large resources, however, are motivated by completely different factors. They're uh, you know, typically web admins and not scholarly publishers. Uh, they don't have such incentive. They don't necessarily care uh, for the longevity of uh, their website, yet alone the integrity of the scholarly record. Uh, so, you know, there's a different, uh, um, different motivation behind that. Um, so, from our point of view, really, the, the notion of or the problem of reference rot is a, is, a, is a problem that is largely rooted outside the scholarly communication community, but uh, we argue that it actually needs to be solved by, by us, by this very same community. So, what's the current state when we reference uh, your, uh, URI? Uh, we use URIs to reference web at large resources. Well, we're guilty as charged because in our uh, 2014 PLOS paper we referenced uh, URIs like that. We uh, included the original URI to, for example, the hyperlink project, hyperlink.org, and uh, we kind of took the easy way out and uh, uh, said, oh, this was last accessed you know, on that particular date. And now we are good, right? Because we promised that what we saw on that particular date is really what we meant to reference. Well, neither for link rods nor for content drift, this helps in any way, really. Uh, but that's the current state. So we are arguing for basically two steps. The one is use the URI that you're referencing and create an archival snapshot, create a memento proactively. You can do this as an author when you're writing your paper. You can uh, do this as a conference or journal submission system when you receive the paper. You can do this as a publisher when you're publishing the paper. You can do this as an aggregation service like Core, for example, when you're aggregating the uh, articles from somewhere else. Obviously, you want to get as close as possible to the authoring process, but you know uh, there are several different stages where you could potentially uh, do that step. We've seen several archives that can do that. The archive is one institution where you can ask them, hey, please uh, go and, and grab this URI for me, archive it for me. PermaCC has been trying to focus on the notion of uh, um, archiving references for scholarly articles. Web Citation has been around for a while for a very similar purpose, archive.is. Uh, is also another one of those proactive um, uh, archiving services that you can ask to archive a particular URI for you. And for all these uh, uh, four, in this case, for all these four services, you will get immediately back the URI of the archive resource, the URI of the memento, which you can then uh, use for on, as we will show. So are we done now? Did we, did we solve the problem? Did we archive something? Well, no, of course we are not. This example uh, gives you uh, it's a reference from a Wikipedia page, and it re uh, points to excuse me, an archived snapshot in the Internet Archive, and it tells you when it was captured. So the problem with that, of course, is that this sort of an approach relies on the continuous availability of that particular archive. Well, of course, we hope it's going to stay around, right? No question about it. But we've seen cases of archives disappear. Right? Do you remember mummify.it? doesn't exist anymore. Web citation has been struggling in the past uh, with support and so on and so forth. We know that the Internet Archive is not accessible in all countries. Right? So there is, uh, um, uh, we're basically replacing one link or problem with another if you rely solely on this uh, uh, sort of an approach. By just replacing the original URI with the URI of the memento, that does not solve the problem for good. Okay? So the second step that we're arguing for is decorate your links. So when you're writing a paper, your, the first step was, as we mentioned, uh, was to create an archival copy of your URI, of your reference, uh, and decorate that link in your paper with the original URI, so don't throw that thing away, with the URI of the memento, of the archival snapshot that you created, and indicate the archival date time of, your, uh, of the archival copy that you created. So with these three pieces of information, you basically create an, uh, a really good fallback me mechanism. Meaning, if your original URI doesn't work anymore, if that's subject to link rot, you can always go back to the, uh, to the memento, to the archive copy. If the archive is uh, in, in, uh, unavailable, is, you know, the access is, uh, is down or the archive uh, has, has stopped to operate, you can always uh, use the original URI to query other archives. Do you have a copy? 
And that combined with the archival date time, the uh, third piece of information that we ask you to decorate your length with, uh, with that information together, you can ask any archive for a very appropriate copy of, uh, uh, of that URI. So basically, give me a copy of the URI at time x. Time x meaning the publication date of the article or whenever you created uh, your reference there. So several fallback me mechanisms preparing for the worst case possible that your original doesn't work anymore, that the archive is down, and other archives are hopefully still available where you can look up a copy of your URI. All right? So it could look like this then. It's another reference from a Wikipedia, actually from the very same Wikipedia article where you would provide the original URI, archived from the original, you provide the capture date time of that URI, and you provide a reference to the archival copy that you have created proactively as an author, for example. Right? So again, these three pieces of information, from our point of view, are essential to make links more robust. So what could this look like? A regular link. A uh, little bit of HTML, not doesn't hurt, um, to uh, cni.org, the canonical website of the uh, CNI. And we can use standard HTML5 attributes to convey these three pieces of information. Right, we still convey now the original URI. We use the data version URL uh, attribute to convey the uh, URI of the memento, of the snapshot that we created. And we use the attribute data version date to convey the date time at which I created that archival snapshot and close our tag. So that's the, uh, the only thing you need to do as a, uh, for example, as an author to make your link more robust, to decorate your link for the uh, necessary information to make it uh, more robust over time. Uh, so we call this approach robust links. We uh, wrote a, a specification document for the URI on the bottom of that slide. And uh, last year, Herbert was fortunate enough to gather the Michael Nelson to publish this paper and uh, they actually talked about this at CNI last year uh, in the fall and um, were able to convince the DLib magazine to implement robust links. So it is an, uh, as you all know, I'm sure it's an online uh, uh, only sort of an, um, a publication venue. It's HTML and uh, we ingested a little bit of JavaScript into the page and uh, results, I'm not sure whether you can see, the results in these little anchor symbols right next to the link that you can click on and you get this little pop-up in the center of the screen that gives you three options for that link. You can go uh, to the, uh, um, to the um, archival snapshot of that link. You can ask the Memento framework to do some magic for you and uh, go to the uh, link in any archive given the link date, so the archival date time. Or, and that's another uh, approach that you can actually do, you can leave uh, the creation date of that page and you can go to the link as it was at the creation date of that page as well. So again, the point is, uh, link decoration is easy. It's based on standards. We use HTML5 attributes. That's not rocket science. Uh, browser supported, everything is good there. And uh, this is one approach with a little bit of JavaScript to make those links actionable and way more robust than before. All right, so I realized that I flew through this a bit uh, uh, quicker than I intended, but I basically have four takeaway messages for you. The first one is, as we've seen, um, scholarly articles increasingly contain uh, URIs to web at large resources, right? Uh, we've all have been there, we all wrote uh, in our writing scholarly articles, we all used URI references to uh, 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 resources that we find on the web that we uh, intend to uh, convey in our message to support our point, for example. So that's all a significant part of scholarly communication, and the trend is increasing so that more and more authors use more and more URI references to web at large resources. So that's the first thing. These resources, however, and that's our, uh, our second observation there, are subject to reference rot. They're not any different than any other web resource, right? They're just regular web resources, hence, they're uh, subject to the same dynamic character of the web. So we see notions of link rot, uh, observe content drift. So there's nothing special. Just because you reference an, uh, a URI in your scholarly article doesn't make the resource any more robust, per se. Right? So we need to do something about that. Um, the custodians of these resources are typically not overly concerned about uh, long-term preservation, uh, long-term access, and integrity, fixity of those resources. Hence, we need to do something about this. 
And we can, as publishers, as authors, as third parties, I mentioned Core, for example, can do something about this. Uh, we can take action to proactively archive our resources because certainly we think that the integrity of our scholarly record is uh, worth it and the price is not all that great. So with that, I stop. I um, uh, left intentionally uh, some time for questions. Thank you so much for listening and I'm, I'm happy to take your questions.